I'm going to invite someone to the stage who does represent the industry. Um, Gunvai Grödlan, thank you. Uh, and now our guest represents the biopharmaceutical industry. Uh, now, your background is uh, from the Norwegian Institute of Public Health, but you also have ex uh, extensive international experience from the University of Oxford, World Health Organization, and CEPI, the Coalition for Epidemic Re Preparedness Innovations. Yeah. So, uh, welcome director of infectious diseases at NICODE, or NICODE Therapeutics, Gunstein Nurheim. Thank you. Um, <laughs> I'm glad to be invited to this seminar. Um, I will first have to have a disclosure in interest as we always do in industry in these settings and uh, I'm a director head of infectious disease in NICODE for the early stage research and uh, this is a for-profit biopharmaceutical company uh, but my opinions and the presentations today represent my own opinions and it's not by the company. So today I'd like to talk to you about the burden of entities and vaccine feasibility uh, I'd like to touch upon learnings from the COVID pandemic and how that can be applied in this field. There's lots of them. And third, what could we do to accelerate NTD vaccines? NTDs are a huge bunch of pathogens, very diverse parasites, bacteria, uh, viruses, and they have different um, um, epidemiology, different geographical uh, burden. Each uh, of them have a difference in how we are progressing and eliminating or decreasing them. And there is difference in what tools we have to counter them and eliminate. So the term neglected uh, tropical diseases was a kind of political term to gather a group of relatively unrelated diseases that received little attention uh, from the um, for funding to, to decrease them. And this has been a uh, movement over time that now has a new um, roadmap. And if you look at the burden, it's uh, uh, usually clear that very um, uh, many countries are affected by these, but there are 16 countries that are bearing most of the burden. And uh, also in these countries, it's usually the poorest uh, in populations that bear most of the burden. Um, between these countries, they differ a lot in the success in, in eliminating disease. Uh, and most importantly, the persistent risk factors differ, but they are, uh, they are there and they will continue and we will not get rid of entities um, as a problem for a very long time. Uh, and uh, some of these could be uh, aggravated due to climate change and population growth and po poverty if we are not able to to raise the income or the living standard. So this uh, goal of WHO is that by 2030, uh, there should be an eradication of two of these diseases and 100 countries should be validated as having eradicated at least one. Also that there should be a um, reduction in, in people needing interventions because many of these needs to be on standing uh, treatment for a long time. And it's uh, with this broad group of diseases, it's also a, a uh, kind of societal approach to eliminating them by uh, uh, large scale mass drug administration, it's uh, sanitation, it's um, case finding and disease management, veterinary one health and also vector management. So how are we doing? It's actually not going too bad. It's going down the last 20 years, but there is a uh, um, a huge job to do and these programs have to be maintained and committed to by the countries that are affected. And that costs a lot of money, personal and healthcare system is, is required to, to engage in it. Um, so if you think of vaccines, uh, I'm of course biased, I'm a vaccinologist, so it's like a hammer, you try to find a nail for it. But it's also a huge success in, in preventing epidemics to uh, manage disease and help out in disease control. 
So for NTDs, um, why don't we have vaccines for those that are most critical? First, some of these are very rare. They, you can't justify a vaccine for them. For some others, uh, there are effective mass treatment approaches, and also it's maybe other style approaches like the wash, the uh, sanitation strategies. It's a foundational uh, role to remove the reservoir or at least reduce the, the exposure. Um, there. Also, for parasites, there could be a biological feasibility element to it, that uh, it's hard to induce protective immunity. We might not know what protects, but also uh, what is the role of the vaccine in, the, in a setting where high exposure exists. Uh, but very importantly, there is no or limited commercial market because these uh, might have populations that are not um, able to pay for the vaccine or governments that are willing to pay for it. Uh, and a final element is that uh, vaccines uh, might, on the contrary side, be useful because if you uh, think of the drug compliance, drug efficacy, effectiveness, and how the efficacy of this is, you need to maintain a huge system over time for the treatment to, to make sure that the elimination goals are reached. So if we look at within these diseases, which of them could be targeted by vaccines? Uh, we could think of those where we have the greatest potential to prevent burden, or we could look at those where a disease is sort of spinning out of control, where you could co be complementing it with existing with vaccines. Uh, or you could focus on uh, vaccines uh, targets where you have a, a nice pipeline where it's low hanging fruit. Um, so with that, you could prioritize by disease burden. You could look at uh, which of these do you have a candidate for, which has the highest burden. Uh, but when you look at these estimates, they are highly uh, un, uh, uh, variable, and uh, the accuracy between them is not also necessarily fair. And using existing data might not e exactly reflect the disease burden in affected countries because of uh, weak surveillance or, or detection. So also a huge element is uh, how should you choose a, a vaccine for this? Um, what we have learned through COVID and also maybe through CEPI is how to engage uh, affected countries in the uh, selection of uh, vaccines that should be targeted for kind of huge programs. It's very important to have buy-in and engagement and scientists involved from affected countries when choosing the future target uh, all along the road. Uh, what we have uh, seen from the epidemic is that, uh, on the bad side, epidemics hurts. It affects the whole of society, potentially. Um, it's a reminder for us how entities also might affect these societies, maybe not on the deadly side, but on the disease burden, the ability to work, to go to school, uh, and so on. Um, also, um, the COVID-19 affected the vaccination coverage. Um, it has uh, very sadly demonstrated clearly the global inequality of access to vaccine uh, with a low proportion of uh, low and middle income countries having access. But on the positive side from uh, vaccine uh, development, uh, we have new vaccine platforms that are demonstrated. mRNA, viral vector and virus-like particles have been proven to show high efficacy in, in trials and these have been um, not uh, well demonstrated before uh, the epidemic. As you can see here is a small uh, highlight of the portfolio infectious disease vaccines and SARS-CoV-2 has 246 candidates around the world, whereas many of the others are, are much fewer. So it has been every single company I think has made a COVID vaccine during these last two years. Um, also, it has been a huge win in terms of that it is able to do this together fast with a dedicated effort that we can use and learn for entities also to apply these new vaccine platform technologies. And one particular thing is time use. Uh, these are all the steps that are shown in the uh, development of a vaccine until licensure and manufacturing. And it takes 10 years, cost 500 million. What we saw in 
the COVID effort was primarily the US government put everything they had funding scientists industry together and they managed to squeeze it down to one year. Um, this was both that things were done in parallel, that we um, had pre-existing knowledge from MERS uh, that helped the structure of the spike protein. Uh, there was mRNA uh, platform development that had been taking place 20 years ago. So these kind of were put together and also the high investment willingness, which is also a kind of example to follow for NTD vaccines that there could be a huge win, but you also need a high investment. Uh, also execution is important to, to have effective implementation of trials, to do smart design so that we have a short development timeline until approval. Um, and how is this then outside COVID? Uh, Welcome Trust has done a fantastic review of the infectious disease um, ecosystem. And they diagnose it and they say that actually progress against disease target is relatively slow, especially for diseases affecting low middle income countries. Uh, we are poor at setting priority areas. Uh, we don't allocate funds on a global level so that there is a balanced portfolio. As you saw, 246 candidates for COVID and very few for others. So that's the imbalance. Also, there are unprofitable and poorly functioning markets. So so that infectious disease vaccines might uh, be prioritized down uh, for other diseases that are more profitable for, for companies. Also, which is uh, now maybe being realized that pandemic preparedness and response should not be the only focus for infectious disease vaccines. There is also a high endemic burden for many diseases, especially entities. So opportunities, it is to uh, do prior to setting for uh, infectious disease that involves the affected countries, which vaccines are wanted, not what is maybe low hanging fruit and is feasible to do. Also to invest in the ongoing threats like um, endemic diseases that could be vaccine preventable. So if you look at this list, uh, the um, Blue dots shows which diseases we have a mass administration program for. The uh, yellow um, triangle show where there could be a vaccine opportunity. And those two of these that are uh, flagged a bit like on an MDA program and also where a vaccine could have a, a use as a co-treatment um, tool is hookworm and schistosomiasis. Uh, and for dengue and rabies, we already have vaccines that are uh, approved. Uh, it's more of the implementation of it. Uh, prioritization is differing between the, uh, the global organizations, but there is uh, some progress to harmonize what is needed for hookworm, leishmaniasis, and schistosomiasis. When it comes to feasibility for parasite vaccines, it's a huge and complex pathogen. It has uh, hundreds of antigens, which them should you choose for vaccine development. Today we have tools to screen, but it, you also need models and, and animal models uh, to validate the relevance of each of these antigen in a vaccine design. Also, these parasites are chronic, many of them. There's a chronic exposure of the antigens, so it can affect the ability of the host to induce immune response um, but also the co-existence uh, of the treatment, prior exposure is important for trials, but also for models, how you, how you use models to predict whether a vaccine is, is likely to cause protection in humans. Uh, and also choice of platform. Some pl platforms that are used, uh, which is the kind of um, course of the um, trade is a recombinant protein with an adjuvant, uh, which is very likely to induce high antibody responses, some T cell response, but not uh, necessarily always a strong one. Whereas nuclear acid vaccines uh, are now shown to, to be able to induce a strong T cell response, which could be critical for the uh, parasite response. And also a multi-antigen approach is likely needed. So based on this, we are coming to three proposals that are being uh, active. Um, there are four to five candidates in trials or have been tested for each of them. There are initiatives, but not necessarily funded to take it beyond phase one or phase two. 
So these are very activist communities. They're very engaged in it. And one particular guy is Peter Hortes, who has been working in this for a long time and a super energetic uh, person who has um, also have, has been able to unlock this collaboration with a partner in, in, effect, in affected countries. And so if we look at the funding, there are some funders, but this is very limited for vaccines and almost nothing for vac NTD vaccines. Costs are quite high. The success rate is also uh, important to look at. Um, and when it comes to the, the kind of conclusion, what could we do? Um, we could learn from the past. We could utilize competence hubs for existing vaccine hubs. I've been part of setting up CEPI after we had the Ebola trial in Guinea. Those two were quite closely linked because the experience from the successful Ebola trial helped shape the consensus that we need an institution to solve this. And CEPI was formed for that purpose. Now we have the COVID epidemic. It's kind of the test of the CEPI system. Did it respond? Now for entities, if you look at that, we could already now prioritize diseases. Instead of building an SL a new organization, you can use the existing organizations that are professional at developing vaccines, but they need funding, they need coordination. Also, the scale of it is our future. How will the risk factors affect the emergence of entities? How will the ability of the countries be in controlling entities? It's a longer game with chronic diseases than you have with uh, acute uh, COVID-19. So prioritization of diseases is key. Engaging countries um, in science, epidemiology, studies that look at disease burden, um, what are the protective immunity, uh, quality protections, and also identify funding mechanisms that can attract developers that are not willing to engage on a low profit uh, on a, unless there's a high profit. In the African region, they now have an ambition to progress to own manufacturing by 2040. Um, but it needs the commitment from start. So it's a long journey. And, you know, a rare animal like a unicorn uh, is also needed. You need vaccine developers that are willing to engage on a high volume production with a low margin for countries that have low payment willingness or ability. And that's a risky business model in the Western countries. But you have examples like Serum Institute in India and others that are able to take that role. So in the end, it's kind of a cheeky uh, peek or poking or nudging to our government. To the left, you have Norway's key partner countries. To the right, you have the countries heavily infect, um, affected by schistomiasis. So maybe there's a potential overlap in the future. Maybe there's a room for Norway to engage in this. Thank you. Thank you.